Are you ready? Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Um, happy Ramadan, 11th day, right? It's unbelievable how quickly this Ramadan is passing, and I hope everyone is enjoying a good Ramadan. Um, I wanted to start, actually, um, it's been really, um, as I said before, bittersweet when people write and ask for our community to pray. I mean, we're, I'm so happy that people want you know our community to pray for loved ones um but at the same time of course it's so sad to um, you know, um have people close to you that you love pass away but i wanted to um ask we have um a dear um a sweet community member who lost an uncle to um covid in bangladesh his name is Razakul Haider. so i want to ask for everyone to please pray for him and inshallah may allah um shower him with mercy grant him um highest to heaven um, inshallah, you know, let us also remember to just pray for everyone who's suffering. Um, you know, it's like we here are so blessed to enjoy so many blessings. I know I, I'm so grateful for this opportunity um, to be studying the Quran and, you know, be with people that I love dearly and, you know, really respect and be focused on, you know, really important work. And I, I can't help but feel a bit guilty because there's so many people around the world that are suffering. And so I think, um, inshallah, you know, we just have to keep them close to our hearts and pray. Um, you know, I, I was so excited, especially after the last um, surah, because um, as we mentioned, it felt like it was um, really focused um, as it was a validation of the work that we do here. And, um, you know, I didn't know that the first two surahs, the first two revelations, we're focused on knowledge, so al-alaq and then al-kalam, and this emphasis on the message from Allah that knowledge and the written word and knowing the Quran, um, you know, using the pen, using the intellect, all of the stuff that we are really focused on here, um, it was just such an incredibly powerful surah, but it just made me feel so proud and excited that that's exactly what we are about here. And so I, I hope that others will be, um, you know, as excited to join us in our journey, especially as we move forward in covering all the surahs um, of the Quran, inshallah. And one of the things that the, the Sheikh actually asked, asked us to do in the reflection group that we had last night um, was to pick a surah that particularly speaks to us personally. Um, and I think he's going to obviously, you know, give us some pop quizzes and some assignments to go with that. Usually, with you know, when he gives us a request like that, it's the beginning of a journey that involves um, some deep reflection and, and maybe some, um, you know, painful, um, you know, confrontation with yourself, but it's always good. Um, and I have to admit, I'm behind on my assignment, so I was starting last night to try and go back and look at my notes. And it struck me, now that we've covered, you know, 30 surahs, just how much depth of knowledge there is and how special every single um, surah has been. And I went back to some of the early ones I was reviewing, um, al from last, I guess it was October, or I actually not remember, it was early in the journey. And just the, the gold um, of, you know, understanding that particular surah was talking to us about how we oftentimes um, build our dreams on what is truly like sand dunes, you know, and not on something that is solid like God. But it, there was so much learning in that, and it just made me very grateful to go back and look at how much ground we've covered. And so um, I know here, especially because we go so quickly through so many surahs, we often don't have enough time to really sit down and connect with each one. Um, but I hope that, you know, um, inshallah, during Ramadan, we will have more time to, to do some of that. Um, and um, just to let you know, we are um, moving forward on Adopt a Surah. The surahs are moving like hotcakes, so hurry up and get yours. <laughs> Actually, that's not quite true, but we've had some <laughs> wonderful people that have stepped forward and um, adopted some of our surahs, and this is where you know we have asked people to give us financial support as we move forward in publishing all of this work, inshallah. So our goal and our dream is to have a complete, you know, the first complete English language, um, English commentary on the Quran um, as you know the, our legacy to leave behind from this very special project and. I think it's a really exciting thing to um, say, hey, this is the surah that I supported, and every single time someone benefits from this surah, Allah knows that you supported the publication of that particular surah. And I have to highlight, there's 
one special person who adopted three surahs. And so he, alhamdulillah, he adopted one. God blessed him like immediately with a job and he was like, oh my God, I have to pay back. So he adopted two more surahs. So God bless you and may Allah, you know, that's like kind of like hogging surahs. So no, <laughs> but alhamdulillah, um, I, I hope that Allah will, you know, bless you for all of your investment and, and all of your faith in our project. And, and uh, inshallah, may, you know, you pray for Sheikh and all of the efforts here going into that. So I'm really looking forward to another um, wonderful surah. Um, another. Okay, so inshallah, we continue on with our journey with the Quran uh, and today inshallah we will be covering Surah Al-Naml um, remember that the lessons of the Quran are cumulative and we are moving at uh, an unreasonably fast pace uh, ideally you would take years to cover all these sorrows so it is very important that you diligently go back and uh, study and reflect and allow all the lessons from all the surahs that we are covering to simmer. Um, this is the only way that um, you can hope to, to transform. Um, The Prophet ﷺ, um, is reported to have said, "Man qara'a Quran fa qad istadraj al nubuwa, ghayr an nahu la yuha ilayh." That and, and here, Qur'an, Qur'an doesn't just mean read the Qur'an, but who, who studies the Qur'an, Stadraj and Ruwa means that they, it, it's very close to the idea that we've been saying um, uh, repeatedly that the Qur'an is a personal revelation. Stadraj and Ruwa means it's as if they have incorporated prophethood within. When you study the Quran, you bear the prophecy. Um, and the closer the Quran grows in your heart, or the more intimately it grows in your heart, and the more it um, the more it becomes vested in your intellect the more truly you have an internal prophet inside of you. Uh, and means that, except that you are not receiving revelation from Allah, uh, d direct revelation, you, but you are engaged with the revelation from Allah. And, um, you know, when, you, when you, if you are a, a, a believer, there is nothing more profound and nothing more beautiful and nothing more worthy than in fact to have istidraj and nubuwa within, to have that, the, to incorporate the prophecy within you. Um, and the closer you, you journey to the Quran, and it is a journey, the, the, the Quran is, it doesn't reveal itself uh, 
you know, it's not a crash course of six months or a year or three years and then that's it, you're done. The Quran is a lifelong journey. It will continue to speak to you and and um, grow with you and mature you for your entire life. And the the longer you are engaged in this and the more intensively you are engaged in this, um, the more you are colored by the Quranic outlook and the, the more you do feel that Allah in fact is speaking to you through the Quran uh, and it's remarkable because you know in, 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 rationally if you are a Muslim and you, you, you if you think in within Islamic terms nothing could be more worthy and nothing could be more valuable, and nothing could be more important um, than to actually understand Allah's speech and to feel Allah's speech within your the the, the heart of your soul. Um, but as you know, it it's. Uh, very few people take that task on and uh, take it to where to, to full fruition. But this opportunity, this journey with the Quran, to make it worthwhile, uh, attending the halakhas is only a first step. What comes after attending the halakhas is listening and re-listening and re-listening and reflecting and studying and remembering and internalizing and changing and transforming uh, all of that. And if you get to a point in your life where you are able to, um, if you memorize the Quran, I don't like memorizing the Quran without understanding the Quran. Uh, I, I think that it's, but if you get to the point where you are intimate enough with the Quran, then take on the, the, um, the task of memorizing the Quran. Uh, and you'll find that it becomes even closer to you and more intimate and uh, would become part and parcel of uh, of you, who you are as a human being. Um, uh, the Quran will be constantly speaking to you um, as innate and as instinctive. Okay, so Surah al naml as we know, um, is the Surah that was revealed between a shuara and a qasas because i mentioned that last halakha and uh it is among the sur known as the tawasin because it starts with ta'sin and we've noted that the tawasin uh, have a distinctive character in that they lay some of the basic theological foundations but unlike the earliest sort that lay theological foundations that have to do primarily with the individual and their relationship with Allah uh, the Tawasin um, address theological foundations for the individual but with social implications and they are clearly uh, addressing the individual with an eye towards the position of the individual vis-a-vis -vis society and so we noticed as we've discussed already 
ذا مريم طه الدخان الشعراء القصص have significant lessons as to social ethics and social mores um, and the look at the individual not just in terms of their personal relationship to Allah but in terms of their position in society and the way the individual should think about the way they interact with society and is impacted by society and the way that they impact society. And as we said uh, in the past halakhas that al-shu'ara and al-qasas, al-dukhan, al-shu'ara and al-qasas, and we, we had not covered in, in numbers, but Dukhan and Shara and Qasas, they, they come in with critical lessons for what we know in retrospect uh, are these transformative periods in the lives of Muslims where the Isra is going to, Surah Al Isra is right after Qasas. So the Isra as a transformative event, and as we said in a Qasas, a Qasas is revealed shortly after the Prophet والسلام, loses his uncle and loses his wife, and the pers persecution in Mecca escalates to unprecedented levels, especially after uh, the death of the Prophet uncle and the prophet's wife and in in many ways it seems like a dukhan and a shara and a qasas are preparing muslims for what is to come and that is the the call to hijrah and the uh, serious task and remarkably challenging task of uh, building a, a new civilization uh, that starts out in a, in a single city, Medina. Um, and in retrospect, in retrospect, we can see how a lot of these lessons were addressing the challenges that Muslims were going to confront and challenges that Muslims were, would have to take on. Um, and so a number comes right in between a shara and a qasas. And it is a, um, as we'll see, it, it's a challenging surah uh, because it, for the persons who, who is studying surah al -Nam carefully and paying careful attention to what the surah is saying, uh, it, it it is presenting critical but subtle lessons, um, subtle lessons that are again that have to do with social mores, with social ethics, and the position of an individual in relation to society and God. So it starts out taught scene, and we've already talked about um, the possible proposed meanings for taught scene. Uh, the um, the only thing that I might have not mentioned about taught scene is that among the sufi esque in the sufi esque tradition there have some that su suggested or that have argued that sans thought seeing uh, is a shorthand indication 
for a command tahir nafsaka ya insan ta'sin tahir nafsak which means purify yourself and they argued that any surah that begins with ta'sin is effectively a a step by step um guide to self purification um I, I don't know, you know, whether I agree with that, but nevertheless, it's it's one of the the things that, or one of the arguments that have been adopted by a number of very prominent Sufi uh, orientations or Sufi scholars and commentators on the Quran. Okay, so Ta'asin, Tilka Ayatul Qurani Wal Kitab Al Mubin. These are the signs of the Quran and a clear book. Interestingly, in some uh, in some surahs, the the we have the the very same beginning, but it will say instead of these are the signs of the Quran and a clear book, it will f- flip it. It will say these are the signs of uh, the book. And a Quran, um, although there are people who have written a lot about this, I I don't think it's for our purposes. I don't think it's that it it, it warrants a long pause. So the affirmation again, we know that whenever the Quran begins with Allah self identifying the Quran as a book that warrants careful attention. It's like Allah say, pay attention. Uh, we know that there's going to be a heavy message delivered. And we, we pay attention and expectation of this message. هُدًا وَبُشْرًا لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ الَّذِينَ يُقِيمُونَ الصَّلَاةَ وَيُؤْتُونَ الزَّكَاةَ وَهُمْ بِالْآخِرَةِ هُمْ يُقِنُونَ A book of guidance and bushra of uh, good tidings for believers. And again, in, in classic Quranic style, whenever it identifies believers, it always affirms belief coupled with action. Prayer and zakah are the among the most two most often mentioned affirmations of Iman, of faith. الَّذِينَ يُقِيمُونَ الصَّلَاةِ Those who perform prayer, establish prayer, and those who continue to uphold the institution of zakah, and those who have certitude about the hereafter. In one ayah, you've got the heart and kernel of Islam. In in my view, and I believe in the Quranic view, without prayer, very little remains of Islam. Of Islam. Without zakah, without caring about others, and because it is not just about Allah doesn't benefit anything from your prayers and we know that all of Islam is for our own good. Uh, so without the institution of the, uh, the most basic affirmation of a social ethic that we care about others and it's not just about self-promotion and self-interest, very little remains of Islam. And if you act without regard to the consequences in the hereafter because you don't think of the hereafter very much you don't think of death 
very much. You don't think of what it means to die and to end up in a grave and to be confronted with the inevitability of accountability and the fact that there will be no escape and the fact that there will be no excuses and the fact that everything, your entire life, you will have to answer to very little remains of Iman. Is it possible for people to pray and not think of the hereafter? Markably, yes. Um, there are people that, you know, they, they get into the habit of praying. They might have been raised Muslim and they were, you know, raised to pray. Uh, but it, it is, yeah, it is sometimes surprising that um, You'll have people who, you know, been Muslim all their life, and they they don't, they, they haven't really internalized the meaning of death, the meaning of accountability, the meaning of resurrection. Okay. And this opening, as we already know, is classic opening for the Tawasin, for the group of surahs that begin with the Tawasin. Um, and immediately, and again it's rather classic of the Tawasin, the, the surah starts differentiating between those who have embraced the path of belief and those who have not. So, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْآخِرَةِ زَيَّنَّ لَهُمْ عَمَالُهُمْ فَهُمْ يَعْمَهُونَ أُولَئِكَ الَّذِينَ لَهُمْ سُوءُ الْعَذَابُ وَهُمْ فِي الْآخِرَةِ هُمْ الْأَخْسَرُونَ وَإِنَّكَ لَتُلَقَّ قُرْآنَ مِنْ لَدُنٍ حَكِيمٍ عَلِيمٍ This takes us to verse 6. So, truly those who do not believe in the hereafter لَقَدْ زَيَّنَّا الَّذِينَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْأَخِرَةِ زَيَّنَّا لَهُمْ عَمَالَهُمْ فَهُمْ يَعْمَهُونَ Those who do not believe in the hereafters, Zayyanna lahum amalahum literally can be translated as the study Quran says, made their deeds appear fair and acceptable to them. What Fahumi Amahun means while they it's like um, while they stumble around in life confused. But the, there is a, 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 a discussion that goes on in the Islamic tradition when When it says that Yanna Lahum Amalahum, is it saying that since they've ignored Iman and since they've ignored Allah, that Allah has led them to their devices and aids them, and Allah aids you per your intent? whatever your intent is. Is it saying that then Allah aided their intent so that they see their evil deeds as good or they are no longer able to see what is the true, uh, the, the true nature of their deeds? Or is it saying that we have taught them what is good, but they decided to ignore it. And this is a debate that you find 
in in the tradition um, the 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 more literal school uh, of tafsir like Ibn Kathir says no it is that Allah aids them so uh, because their intent is bad so Allah aids their evil intent so that they see their bad good deeds are, are as good or at a minimum no longer see what is so bad about what they do uh, while m- more um, more interpretive orientations um, uh, like al Metaridi, for instance argues that no it is uh, God has given them the ability to see good as good but they chose to ignore it so means that we in fact have explained to them or give them given them the means to understand what is good but they chose to ignore it what I, I just as a quick comment As we will see, as we, the surah takes us to its full journey, that if your relationship to the Quran, or if your relationship to to um, um, to, to divine revelation, to life itself. Um, uh, is self-referential if fundamentally you know as as we said before it is possible to take the shahada to even pray but attitudinally as a matter of attitude as a matter of consciousness you really do not see an authority higher than yourself so even when you read the quran you read the Quran to leverage it to justify your ada and your orf, your habits, um, and this is what, as we will see, so much of Islamic uh, um, books of Aqa and so much of Islamic theology. Uh, it tries to help people fight that egocentric self that, can, that that is capable of even disrupting divine revelation or co-opting divine revelation so that it's marshaled in its quest to worship itself um, and in especially if you read in the Sufi tradition that is the biggest test that any human being is is confronted with. So, if one is self-referential, as we will, will, will see in this Surah al um and doesn't understand their their role in life, their position in existence. the inability to see good as good or losing the ability to see good as good because in the islamic belief it's usually belief that it's lost it's not that it was never there but that it's if, um, people in itself indulge 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 until they lose the ability to see what is good as good um is one of the uh worst plights that allah can decree for a human being. Okay, so so with this general introduction, this is a book of guidance, but belief and practice, practice is oriented towards the divine, but practice also has it cannot be solely a matter of 
it, the relationship of the individual to God, but it has a social component that is at least 50% of the relationship. In other words, that it, Iman must produce social good. This is the zakah, symbolized by the zakah. Uh, because interestingly, in, um, in Sharia, when they have a reference to the zakah like this, they don't, they tell you that the Quran is not talking about the technical zakah. In other words, the Quran is not talking about two, the two and a half percent that of excess money that you save for the hulu alayha al that you save for a year. But Quranic references to zakah in this context include the zakah and the sadaqah. So it is the technical zakah, but it is also beyond the technical zakah. So is it possible for someone to pay the official zakah, the two and a half percent, for money that they have saved for over, and, and still not be in good standing with God? Yeah, it is possible. It depends on what their income is, what their needs are, and what Allah knows to be their income and their needs. And it, it depends on their relationship to material wealth, um, which is you know something that the individual and God are the ones that, that will judge, that can assess and evaluate and judge. Anyway, okay. So then, in this introduction, that it tells you that the, the there is a fundamental problem in that those who do not believe their relationship to goodness and husn and qub, their relationship to goodness and badness or ugliness is skewed. And, and the inevitable fate that Allah affirms every time that you exist, acts have consequences. All acts have consequences. If there's anything that the Quran has emphasized so many times, do not believe for a second that there will be no consequences. Uh, it is remarkable because even, you know, um, right now, for instance, there's a fad going around in the Muslim world. I haven't seen it in the United States so much, but, you know, I I don't follow social media and stuff like that, so maybe. But I, I've seen it in some, uh, quote-unquote, intellectual circles in the Middle East where people start, where people nowadays are saying, yeah, well, you know, all this... Quranic talk about hellfire is just symbolic and there is no real hell. Um, it, it is remarkable how, you know, it's as if Allah knows that the human mind will always try to evade responsibility. So it will always try to walk away from the concept of accountability. And so time and time and time and time again, Allah reminds us no, there is there are going to be consequences, and there there is accountability, and don't think that somehow you're going to fudge it, um, somehow you're going to manage to avoid it. Okay, so after this introduction, Surah An Nam presents us with five stories, effectively, and after these stories, it will talk about. the relationship of the individual to the divine and to creation. The stories will start with Musa السلام, and a short narrative about the story of the ant and Prophet Sulaiman 
And then it will move on to the story of Queen Balqis. Um, is, it, is Balqis called Sheba in, in yeah. English? Yeah. So Sheba or Balqis um, and Prophet Sulaiman salam. So that's three. And then four, the story of Saleh. And five, it mentions the story of Lut. And as we know in the Qasas of Qur'ani, in the Qur'anic narrative, every time the story is presented, it is not presented in exactly the same terms. Depending on the surah, it is presented in slightly different terms. And if you are studying the Qur'an carefully and paying attention to the Qur'an, you pay attention to what is emphasized every time the story is mentioned in a surah. Because it, the, the obvious question is, well, the story of Moses is mentioned in so many different surah, but every time there are different aspects to the story of Moses that are emphasized and other aspects are not even mentioned at all or de-emphasized. And that becomes, as we'll see, an important part of understanding what Surah Al-Naml is about. These five narratives that, and then the conclusion to these narratives that comes afterwards um, are critical, critical to figuring out what Surah Al-Naml is about. Okay, so then it starts out with the story of Moses, Musa alayhi salam. And it starts out with a familiar theme for us because we did Surah Al-Qasas and we did Surah Al-Shara. And it says, As qala Musa li ahlihi inni anastu naran sa'atikum minha bi khabarin aw atikum bi shahabin qabasin la'allakum tastaloon. فلما جاءها نودي أم بورك من في النار ومن حولها وسبحان الله رب العالمين يا موسى إنه أنا الله العزيز الحكيم وألق عصاك فلما رآها تهتز كأنها جان ولا مدبرة ولم يعقب يا موسى لا تخف إني لا يخاف لدي المرسلون إلا من ظلم ثم بدل حسنا بعد سوء فإني غفور رحيم وادخل يدك في جيبك تخرج بيضاء من غير سوء في تسع آيات إلى فرعون وقومه إنهم كانوا قوما فاسقين فلما جاءتهم آياتنا مبصرة قالوا هذا سحر مبين وجحدوا بها واستيقنتها أنفسهم ظلما وعلوا فانظر كيف كان عاقبة المفسدين so this will take us all the way to verse 14. And it starts with a familiar scene. It, it doesn't start with Moses in Egypt it, or Moses with his mother, which we know and comes in the Qasas, right? Or Moses with his sister. It start and it doesn't even start and remember in surah nam is revealed before a qasas so and not even moses as he helps the the two women and eventually marries the younger sibling and younger sister but it starts with moses on his way back from egypt and it puts us immediately in contact or in, in touch with, with his desperation. It's as if the opening scene is a man in the desert with a family. It doesn't give us details at all about this family other than it's clear that he is alone, and it's clear that they're desperate, and it's clear that 
they are looking for help. A point of if you if you put yourself in his position, if you've ever been in in the desert, it's one. Of, it was very beautiful when you were in in the desert alone. But it's also, I mean, it's remarkably serene. But in the solitude is amazing. But it's also very lonely. I mean, it, it, this is the point where you you really understand what and you also feel like you know god if i pray in the desert allah will hear me because there's no one around for her you know but but at the same time you you realize how fragile you are you you, uh, you run out of water if if no one comes to your aid uh, the night in the desert is very cold the days are usually hot and the, the, if you don't have a fire, if you don't have something to burn, which unlike you know in the U.S. where you can always find stuff to burn, um, uh, you're you're you could very easily you're gone. If there is a a a, uh, a sandstorm or you could get buried in the desert and lost forever. So it it's a it, it's. A moment of real desperation and for him to see a light and to say well I'm going to walk towards this light and I'm gonna leave my family behind um, again it's a it's a sign of desperation because if the family was strong if the family had supplies the family would travel with him to check the light the other thing is that in the desert uh, you are very well aware of mirages and um, and one of the commentators that I read a long time ago said you know travelers in the desert see lights and normally they're terrified of these lights because the, the these are sort of uh, the ghost lights that sometimes you see in the desert it could be gin lights you know these mysterious lights that orbs that show up from a great distance and you don't know what they're about and as you travel towards them they disappear um but moses was we know that moses was in absolute desperation and he was going to pursue the light regardless you know it, it was worth the risk for him and he tells his family, and again, like Surah Al-Qasas and like Surah Al-Shara, in Surah Al-Nam, Allah reminds us that he tells his family, I'm going to pursue this light for a very practical reason. I'm hoping that I can get something that would help us. I'm hoping that I can come back with fire or come back with provisions. And yet, at this moment of remarkable desperation, the lowest point after this the, the, the it is the point of absolute transformation for Musa this is the point that he is shrouded in luminosity and what exists at this light is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala nothing short of. And Musa alayhi salam is It's not that he has been prepped for this, and it's not that he was expecting this. In fact, when he first encounters something that his mind cannot quite absorb, and that is his uh, cane transforming to some type of what, whatever it transformed to, a snake, um, uh, the, his immediate reaction is fear and wanting to run away.
And again, we are reminded in Surah al that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comforts Moses and says, no, I, I know what you're really about. Despite your fear, despite your your own insecurities and lack of confidence, I know what you're about. And remember that we know from Surah Al-Dukhan and Surah Al-Shara that when Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala tells Moses, go to the Pharaoh, and he, immediately his response is very human. I fear that he's going to kill me. I fear he's going to torture me. And I fear that I will not be able to express myself very eloquently. So can, can I please have my brother with me? But in Surah al it doesn't tell us anything about his brother. It simply tells us about the fact that Allah comforts him and says that special relationship that I have is enough for you to forget about your fears. But Surah al nam mentions something else that even is not mentioned in Surah Al-Qasas. <clears throat> and there is the nine, what the Quran calls the nine, uh, tisa, uh, yeah, the, the, the nine signs, um, the, um, the nine plagues, is that what it, they're known in the biblical world? It's nine plagues, well, not nine plagues, but nine afflictions. Um, uh, actually, let's see how the study of Quran puts it. This is, uh, what is it? Um, 12. Um, it says signs. It just says signs? Yeah. Yeah, it does say signs. Yeah. Okay. Okay, and what we know by by the the nine signs are the 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 same biblical uh, plights or um, uh, curses that are sent upon the Egyptians once they reject Moses, the 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 frogs, the um, 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 what do you call them? The grasshoppers that eat their crops, locusts. The, the, the locusts, the, the locusts that eat their, their, their crops, so on and so forth. So there are nine consecutive punishments when the Egyptians insist on persecuting the Israelites and insist on rejecting the message of Moses and they are going through and eventually, although the Quran doesn't explain it, but we know from the biblical tradition that eventually the pharaohs even go to Moses and say, you know, can, can you do something? But the reference in the Quran here is what is most interesting. Where it tells us that وَجَحَدُوا بِهَا وَاسْتَيْقَنَتْهَا أَنفُسَهُمْ this is 14. Let's see how he translated it. Uh, they rejected them, rejected the signs, though their souls were convinced of them, wrongfully and exultantly. Um, sort of disappointed in the translation, but... Uh, that... Suffering what they suffered, formally, they continued to agree with the Pharaoh that none of this is real, that all of this is coincidence, and none of it is an affliction or a punishment from God. So in other words, although their, their, the quality of their life got materially affected, 
and things continue to go from bad to worse. But the elite in the state could not afford to give legitimacy to Moses or to his God or to accept that any of what was coming to the Egyptians was in fact punishment for their for their misdeeds. Although, and the Quranic expression is remarkable because although internally they knew that God was punishing them, but officially they will never admit it. So Surat al-Nam here gives us an element to ponder and to reflect on that is fascinating. It's like saying look for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at your lowest point. And at the lowest point, your ego just might be humbled enough for you to see the divine in ways that you would be oblivious to if your ego is not humbled. This is a very common problem. The divine could be right next to us, but we just ignore that fact because we haven't hit the lowest point yet. But understand something about society itself that even when from the perspective of a reasonable believer it is obvious that Allah is sending all the messages that Allah is sending Allah is telling you repeatedly what you're doing is wrong when human beings react collectively with a power structure it is often not about the truth and although individually if you get them as individuals they'll say yeah you know so you might get this white man or white woman individually and they might admit yeah you know we do have a problem with racism. But they get collectively in a Trump rally and what they would admit individually is gone. Take, this is sort of a, a, a sensitive um, point, but, but worth mentioning. Take contemporary Arabs right Masha Allah contemporary Arabs conspired with the British and destroyed the Khilafah they conspired with the British and lost Palestine they conspired with the British and the Americans and the French and they were defeated in war after war after war since the end of the Khilafah till today, their life is absolutely miserable. Civil wars, no future, oppression, despotism, everything. But yet, till now, have an audience with Sisi or the rulers of the Emirat or the rulers of Saudi and they'll give you the most bizarre explanations for our plight. Oh, it's the Muslim Brotherhood's fault. 
The Muslim Brotherhood have never been in power. The Muslim Brotherhood have been oppressed since the 1930s. The Muslim Brotherhood have been your punching bag for decades. They don't matter. They don't count. It doesn't matter. I mean, historians, I am sure, writing centuries from now, it will be so obvious Allah's wrath, Allah's anger. But comfort the people living through the historical moment, and it takes a great act of courage to admit that Allah is angry with us and Allah is punishing us. Why is that? Sometimes the most powerful and painful points are the most obvious points. You don't need French social philosophers that speak in double and triple language. You know, that, who, who obfuscation is, a, is an objective in itself in, in their theories. Sometimes the truth is just very straightforward. Have we depressed you guys? Yes. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> okay. And look, after Allah tells you that they know what the truth is, they, they individually, but collectively, they continue to deny the truth. فَانْظُرْ كَيْفَ كَانَ عَاقِبَةُ الْمُفْسِدِينَ This is 14. So, can reflect upon, reflect upon the fate of the corrupt. So, this is lesson number one. But we're going to tie it to, to why the, the theme of Naml. But first, it gives us this. And remember, it's talking to the Prophet Muhammad and to the followers of the Prophet Muhammad in lessons that they will heed and some of them will be too challenging and, and it, it, will get, it get, will get away from them after, especially after the death of the Prophet But understand it is not just about you preaching, it's not just about the message, it's not just about how well you present the message, it's not just about the miracles, it's it, it, human beings especially when they get into these social units are elusive and complex. Um, uh, wait. Then it moves on to now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala moves on Surah al Nam to telling us about Sulaiman. First the transition that from the lineage of Moses we know that there is Dawood, David, and alayhi salam, and then from Dawood, Sulaiman alayhi salam. 
And uh, among Dawood's children, Sulaiman inherited the Dawood's kingdom, alayhum salam and the Prophet Sulaiman was given unprecedented gifts and blessings and abilities. In the the Prophet Sulaiman could communicate with nature, living beings from the the I mean, they're, they're, they're especially in the biblical tradition. There's you can uh, and um, in the Talmud, there's so much mythology about Solomon and and what he could communicate with and what he could do. I mean, the Quran uh, tells us very little, but a lot of the Israelite traditions entered. The Islamic tradition through the Qusas, although a lot of it was considered not authentic. But anyway, so at least the Quran told us that Sulaiman communicated with Al-Tayr, with uh, birds, and um, communicated with living beings, including things as small as ants, but Suleiman also had in his service or a, a, a jinn, which is significant for human history in so many ways. A lot of um, a lot of the magic that is used even today uh, it all goes back to the Prophet Suleiman. The, 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 you know, books like Shams al Ma'arif in the Islamic tradition claim that to refer back to some of the language that the Prophet Suleiman used to communicate with jinn, but except that the Prophet Suleiman was authorized, and so his communication with jinn was a good thing. But when we use that language to communicate with jinn, that's not a good thing, uh, because we're not authorized. And um, although in the Islamic, at least in the Islamic context, a lot of those who ins do use this language to communi communicate with jinn will pretend like they are authorized and they will tell you, oh, we do it all in the name of Allah and the Prophet and so on and so forth. It's all a lie. None of it is authorized. Um, and, and so, you know, if, if you're smart, you'll, you'll stay far, far, far away from the stuff. But what's interesting is that both in the Islamic and Jewish tradition, um, the, the, the Solomonic um, tradition is, is, is nearly identical. Um, the symbols, what, the meaning, the, um, um, and it moved on to the West. So the, the whole, you know, the impact of that Jewish and Islamic um, corpus on uh, on various aspects of culture in the West w was huge. So, um, and we gave David and Solomon knowledge and favored them above many of God's servants. Solomon inherited David and said, Oh, mankind, we have been taught the language of birds and we have been given of all things. Um, 
And for Solomon were gathered hosts of jinn and men and birds who served Solomon until they came upon a valley of ants. And an ant said, Enter your dwellings, lest Solomon and his host crush you while they are unaware. First, قال الحمد لله الذي فضلنا على كثير من عباده المؤمنين ولقد أتينا داود وسليمان علما وقال الحمد لله الذي فضلنا على كثير من عباده المؤمنين It's interesting that a lot of the Quranic commentators when they come to the, this the, this is verse 15 if you're following that when in that reference to the knowledge being given to David and Solomon. Um, I've always thought it was interesting that Quranic commentators will always take this opportunity to, to sort of start talking about the value and worth of knowledge. Um, so, so for instance, here this quote, I don't remember where it's from, but um second maybe I should ask Rami. Rami. <laughs> okay, so I, I have the quote but I can't fit the Quran and quote where I can read the both at the same time. Oh, cool, okay. That's great. So this ayah 15 says, وفي الآية دليل على شرف العلم وتقدم وأن نعمة العلم من أجل النعم وأن من أوتي فقد أوتي فضلا على كثير من عباده وما سمه رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم ورث الأنبياء لمداناتهم في شرف في الشرف والمنزلة لأنهم قوام بما بوصي من أجلهم so on so forth that that if Allah mentions knowledge given to prophets as one of the greatest bounties, Quranic commentators often then comment on this by saying it is important to remember that among the greatest blessings that Allah could ever give a human being or human beings is knowledge, knowledge in all its forms knowledge whether of nature, um, creation, any form of knowledge is a blessing and a bounty from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, okay. So Sulaiman is marching, comes to a place where there are ants, and Sulaiman salam in some way, form or another, understands that the ant is concerned about this army coming, stomping upon the ant territory and causing uh, great damage. So in one way or the other, the ant warns its fellow ants to go underground. And as a result, Sulaiman holds back his army to give an opportunity to the ants to go deep underground before continuing on with their marsh. And uh, you find in Quranic commentaries a lot of writing about, you know, uh, uh, we learn from this that um, if at all possible, you must avoid the destroying the insect nests. You must avoid killing any ants or any living creatures unnecessarily. That uh, the, the, you know you find writings like if you are walking somewhere, you should always look at the ground where you're putting your feet so that you don't crush living creatures 
unknowingly or accidentally um, that if you know when we had a flat tire when we were driving to Ohio I remember we or was it the flat tire or, but anyway we something was wrong with the the thing that we were driving and when we stopped uh, I noticed that there were like all these ant um, mounds it was like in a desert you know weird place we stopped in a place where there were no other cars but all these like places were ants live so it, you know I immediately I remembered all the the Sharia um, uh, um, invocations that if I would to walk in this area then I have I, I would actually be responsible before Allah because unless I have a good reason to walk then I should avoid the areas so not to disrupt their nests and even if I do walk I have an obligation knowing that now that I have noticed that there are a lot of ant mounds there I have an obligation to watch where I put my feet so I don't unnecessarily disrupt you know so it's you know you find a lot written about things like that uh, the most um, literalists of the orientations, they say, well, what we take from Surah al Nam is an obligation not to disrupt ants and not to, um, uh, and not to disrupt or not to kill hoodhoods. Um, what is a hoodhood? Um, huh? I don't know that word. Okay. Hey? What? Yeah, that's a weird word. How do you spell it? H O P H O E or something like that. H O P O E. Hopo? Yeah, H O O P O E. Hopo? I thought Hood was coming with Oh, Hopo. H O P O E. Oh, interesting. Birds. Birds. Yeah, both who does. I like their mohawks. Um, so I mean, the, it, the most literalists among among them to say, well, it, you know, there's a special rule for ants and hopos, I guess, and hoodhoods. But you know, Abdullah, most authorities went well beyond that and said, well, you know, it's not just ants and, and these types of birds. Um, okay, so. We have this brief encounter where Solomon is marching, takes note, pauses the army. Now, so one obvious point that so many commentators have, have noted is how the purposes of Allah on earth are promoted through knowledge it is solomon's knowledge of what went on with the ants that led to the preservation of ant life one of the commentators this was a fourth century commentary said so if someone discovers which I thought was very interesting considering you know that it was written what 1100 years ago if someone discovers a way to understand the anin al namli uh, the, the, the whining of ants like their cries for help it w they would be rewarded by God for every ant life they save. So one obvious point is the value of knowledge itself. Yes, the knowledge given to Solomon was a gift from Allah. But what if we are not given that knowledge as a gift from Allah? Then we have an obligation to achieve that knowledge even if it's not a useful life. It's not, the point is not learning the ants, but the point is learning whatever leads to that result. So that's one thing. 
but and note as, as the, the Prophet Muhammad is not given that knowledge. He's, he's not given that, that miracle. But yet, what the Prophet learns in his seerah, if you study his ghazawat and study his seerah, is that he is very conscientious about the environment and what he disrupts and doesn't disrupt. So we actually have a narrative of him coming upon an ant mound and then ordering his troops to go around it. Um, but other than that, other than that, why would Allah mention ants? I mean, if the point is how knowledge could lead to the preservation and the protection of Allah's creation. Why ants in particular? And why was this surah became known as Surah Al-Naml? And what ethos did it leave Muslims with? These are all the critical questions that we must ask. Most of this, of the answer to these questions, or the answers to this question, I'll come back to later. But for now, consider the following. What is Sulaiman's Sulaim's response to what the ant said? The best Samadahika, right? He he is his response is to thank Allah for that knowledge and to thank Allah and to, in fact, res to, to react to this by holding back his army to promote the protection of the life of the ants. So, what your attention is drawn to is the, the smallest the most minute and arguably the most insignificant of elements in your divine enterprise. This is a man who's communicating with jinn, who we are told has thousands of human beings the answer to him. His kingdom was supposed to, in Jerusalem was supposed to be unheard of. Who achieved for Jews or for the Israelites rather than Jews, the Israelites, what no other king achieved more than King David. He expanded the Israelite kingdom in Palestine to unprecedented levels. The fanatic Israelites of today, fanatic Israelis still dream of recreating Solomon's kingdom because it dominated the entire Middle East, right? But in the Quranic outlook, which doesn't exist in the Bible, his attention is drawn to what? to ants, not just the big themes, not the big picture, not all the jinn that are serving him and doing all types of these amazing things for him, but ants. So keep this in mind, because we'll come back to it. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. 
So, after we have this brief episode with, or after the ant enters into the picture, then we have Sulaiman is marching on with his considerable army and the hoodhood here um, is reportedly had um, in, in, in Suleiman's army a lot of these reports come from the biblical tradition and the Talmud and so on. But the, the jinn had roles, all types of different uh, creatures had roles, and the hoodhood, that bird, uh, his specific role was to search for water. He would fly over and in, in some reports, whether they're authentic or not, something else, that he had the ability to sense underground water, but we don't, I mean, whether that's true or not, it's not the, the issue. But that his, his role was to search for water. And Sulaiman Ali Salam has a regimented army with clear duties and um, clear roles and he notices that the hood hood is missing, that bird is missing. And he believe, he suspects that the hood hood is a deserter from his army. And the the biblical tradition especially has some interesting narratives about uh, desertions by jinn and rebellions by jinn against um, Sulaiman, which does not make it, which is not in, incorporated in the Quran. But anyway, so he says, you know, he, he expresses that look for the hood hood, and if in fact he's a deserter, he's going to be punished. The only reason I, I flag this punishment issue. Um, um, <laughs> wait, he said, um, yeah, so he says, uh, I will punish him, se severe punishment, or slaughter him unless he brings me a clear warrant. Uh, the, there's some, you know, you could tell you, uh, when when interpreters don't have an ethical core, uh, there are some bizarre interpretations that take from that cited this uh, ayah to say, well, it is legitimate to severely punish animals if they disobey you. But then they interpret severe punishment, and some of the best responses to them will say, well, severe punishment for the hoodhood could have been simply an expulsion from Suleiman's army as a prophet. So it, it, is, it is you who has a problem if you interpret severe punishment to mean torture rather than something like exclusion. Do you, do you see the point I'm saying? Uh, as... Um, let me just make sure I'm not forgetting anything. Yeah. Um, as uh, I think it was Ibn Hazm who says, "Al insanu yaqbalu ma yaliqu bi tabi, 
وشهوات that when something you, you should always watch out for is that when it comes to interpretation, including relig religious interpretation, that human beings have a tendency to read things through the prism of their subjective being, what, who they are. And so if, if they're cruel human beings, they will read severe punishment as a, some type of a, a license to torture. And, but if they're an ethical human being, they will read severe punishment to be something like, I'm going to expel him from my army or I'm going to exclude him, or I'm going to imprison him for a period of time, you know. It, anyway. Um, so, as we know from then, the narrative of the third story in Surat al-Nam is that the hoodhood does reappear and tells the Prophet Suleiman I have found a kingdom, and this is a prosperous kingdom, kingdom led by the queen of Sheba. The, the, the kingdom is the kingdom of Sheba, and Balqis is the queen, and that, the, that kingdom is in Yemen, and they are um, of Zoroastrian influence beliefs. They they worship the sun. Um, some reports said that they worship fire, but that's probably not accurate. It's it's more accurate that they were sun worshippers. Okay. And although this is in Yemen, but we know that. In fact, Yemen, Judaism extended to Yemen for a period of time. Um, uh, and it's, it's, so yeah, there, Yemeni Jews still exist till today. But anyway, so the, the Prophet then heads to Yemen and he's going to give the Queen of Sheba and Malqis uh, he sends a, a letter with the hoodhood, and the letter gives warning to the Queen of Sheba that an invitation to, to uh, it's, it's a, you know, either worship the, the, the one God or there is a state of warfare between me and you. Okay. Um, there are a lot of, I mean, the, the Queen of Sheba has, um, there are a lot of mythology and narrative about her, uh, but the Quran doesn't affirm a lot of these narratives, but you do find through the Israelite tradition some of these narratives. So for instance, there is a narrative that she, her, she was the child of a marriage between a human being and a jinn. Um, uh, Arazi has a, a, a wonderful response to this where he basically says this is nonsense. Um, I don't think I've, I've copied it. Anyway, you know, he says that th this is irrational and um, the idea that uh, that she is the, the child of a... And in fact, he, he rejects the idea that the jinn and, and human beings can marry of, or have children. Uh, there's a, there, there are narratives that she... Her father was the king of Sheba, and when he dies, there is someone who comes to the throne, I forgot his name, 
Um, but that that king who replaces her father or who takes over after her father is very unjust and it basically is a complete disaster. So the queen of Sheba asks him to marry her. And after he marries her, she ends up assassinating him and taking over power. Uh, but what is clear is that under her rule, uh, the the um, kingdom is very prosperous and does extremely well. So she's a very good ruler. And eventually, even after she follows uh, Suleiman and and gives allegiance to Suleiman and converts to Suleiman's faith, he ends up confirming her as the queen in her position as queen of Sheba. So she continues ruling Sheba as the queen for the rest of her life. Um, and the kingdom of Sheba itself continues to be in very good shape until she passes away. And then I guess the, the man who rules after her uh, doesn't do as well. The, in Sufi-esque traditions, this whole narrative about the hudhud and the Queen of Sheba um, it produces some very interesting re results. Um, so, the reference to the hudhud, what is the hudhud again in English? Uh, hop hopo? Very strange word. Anyway. So here is, I'll, I'll read it first in Arabic. Um, one of the Sufi uh, tafsir says the following, Hudhud kullu insan nafsi, faiza tafakkadha fawajadaha ghaiba anillah fi awdiyat al-ghafla, hadhadha bil-azab al-shadid, wa azbaha bil-anwa' al-mukhalafa, hatta ta'tih bihujja wadiha. فإن لم تأتي بحجة عذبها وذبحها بيدخلها في كل ما تكره ويثقل عليها فتمكث غير بعيد فتأتي بالعلوم الدنيا والأسرار الربانية التي لم يحض بها علم قبل ذلك وتجيء بالخبر اليقين في علم في العلم بالله من عين اليقين أو حق اليقين uh, so what he's saying is that he reads the the the, the narrative about the hopu, the hudhud, as symbolic, and he's saying that each of us has your own hudhud, and that. The, the internal hudhud that each of us has is often a troublemaker and often um, w goes to distractions that are far away from um, and that he says that the, 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 the whole idea of the hudhud look, looking for a kingdom and uh, whether finding a kingdom, not finding a kingdom, he's, he's saying, think to your, about, think about your, your own bird, in, in a way. Um, does your bird see kingdoms of the divine, find kingdoms of the divine, or does your bird just simply fly, fly around lost with no purpose? And, and then, most importantly, he says that this entire discourse about the Prophet Sulaiman and threatening to torture or to kill the uh, Hopo is intended as a message to you that if you notice that your Hopo is distracted, that your bird is distracted, that your bird is aimless, that your bird is pointless, that your bird is lost, the only response is that you have to be harsh with your bird. You have to discipline your bird. You can't be gentle with your bird. You have to take yourself and say to your bird, 
you're not working hard enough. You're not honest enough. You're not sincere enough. The only way you're going to wake up is to suffer. And push that bird to discomfort, to the zones of discomfort, so that it will wake up. And instead of guiding you to pointless uh, terrain, it will guide you to divine kingdoms. That's part of the tradition. Um, similarly, they read the reference to the Quranic references to the Queen of Sheba. And again, I'll read the Arabic first, then I'll paraphrase it. إِنِّي وَجَدْ إِمْرَأَ تَمْلُكُمْ يَعْنِي وَهِيَ نَفْسَهُمُ الْأَمَّارَةِ وَأُوْتِيَتْ مِنْ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ تَشْتَهِيهُ وَتَهْوَى مِنْ غَيْرِ وَازَعْ وَلَا قَامِعْ وَلَا عَرْشْ عَظِيمٍ وَهُوَ سَرِيرُ الْغَفْلَةِ وَالْإِنْهِمَاكْ فِي حُبِّ الدُّنْيَا وَالشَّهَوَاتِ لَا تَصَلُّتْ كَبِيرٌ عَلَى مَنْ مَلَكَتْهَا وَجَدْتُهَا وَقَوْمُهَا يَجْلِدُونَ لِلشَّمْسِ وَيَخْضَعُونَ أَيْ يَسْجُدُونَ لِلسُّوَى وَيَخْضَعُونَ لِلْهَوَى مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ وَذَيَّنَ لَهُمُ الشَّيْطَانُ ذَلِكَ فَصَدَّاهُمْ عَنْ طَرِيقِ الْوُصُولِ فَهُمْ لَا يَهْتَدُونَ إِلَى الْوُصُولِ إلى حضرة أبدا ما داموا كذلك لأن حضرة ملك الملوك محرمة على من هو لنفسه مملوك لأن حضرة ملك الملوك محرمة على من هو لنفسه مملوك ألا يسجدوا بقلوبهم لله وحده فإنه مطلع على خبايا القلوب والأسرار وعلى ما يصرون من الإخلاص وما يعلنون من الأعمال التي توجب الاختصاص. So what he's saying is that look, think of the relationship of the Queen of Sheba to its people. Queen of Sheba ruled over these people with absolute power, and she could do whatever she wills, whatever she wants. Think of what type of queen rules over your own kingdom. Does your queen inside of the kingdom of the self rule with restraint, with morals, with ethics, with principles, with rules? Or do you simply prostrate before your queen prostrates before its own pleasures. So your, your queen worships its own pleasures. It just does whatever the whim calls upon her to do. And لِأَنَّ حَضْرَةْ مَلِكِ الْمُوكِ مُحَرَّمَةَ عَلَى مَنْ هُوَ لِنَفْسِهِ مَمْلُوكِ Because there is a principle involved that Malik al-Muluk is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you want to be in Hadrat Malik al-Muluk, if you want to have the presence of the Divine, subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's not possible if you own yourself. So unless you surrender yourself to Allah, you have no hope of in fact being in Allah's presence. As long as you retain ownership of yourself, then it's a fool's errand. It's it's never going to happen. Um, I I flag this because obviously, I mean, the Surah al Nam in the ends up, and especially the this whole narrative about the ant, the hood hood, the bird, and the queen of Sheba becomes very significant in the Sufi imagination. And it even inspires huge works of literature like the Conference of the Birds, um, which is a, a great work of not just literature, but ethics and morality and adab. Um, and 
in Sufi literature, a lot of the Sufi metaphors inspired by Surat al um always has the characters, animals and birds. So they tell immorality tales always with animals and birds as the and it and all of that it's deeply steeped into the imagery of Surat al Nam. Okay. So uh, I'll move on, but like in twenty seven where he says, Qala sanandur asadakta am kunta mina kazibin, where Solomon is telling the, the hoodhood, um, I will see if you are truthful or lying. For in the Sufi ask tafasir, they say this, this is not really about Solomon suspecting the character of the, um, Hopo, but it is symbolic to look within as to your own bird and to suspect that your bird is often lying to you. Your bird will tell you, I found a divine kingdom, but your bird will actually often be telling you a lie. It, it is not a divine kingdom, it is a kingdom of the self. It's about self-indulgence. And, and so the, the, a lot of the questions, now uh, there, there is, uh, you might ask, well, you know, is, is there a background argument to this? Well, you get a sense of the back, background discourse, um, background narratives and debates. Um, If you look at Tafsir al-Razi, for instance, the Razi tells you that al-Malahida, the atheists, looked at Surat al-Nam and often used Surat al-Nam to argue against the Quran. Why? Because they picked on a lot of these things about Solomon telling the, the hoodhood. So, for instance, among what the atheists would say is well, if the hopo is searching for water, why does he find a kingdom? And why is he acting like a like a, an outlook for kingdoms? And why, when he tells Solomon, does Solomon not believe him and say, "I will see if you're lying or not lying," and and, and so on and so forth? So the in, in, in the it's obvious that. Atheists at even Razi's time were raising all these questions about um, um, Surat al Nam. And for, in the Sufi ask Tafasir, they, they basically say, well, this is, um, this is not what it's about. The, 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 this is, misses the point. But as you will see, my, my approach takes a different, um, a, 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 a different, you know, we'll, we'll see. Okay. Okay, so the character of the Queen of Sheba is fascinating, right? She receives the message, she calls a Shura Council, she tells her Shura Council that I can't take a decision like this, whether to go to war or to negotiate with Suleiman without you. The military 
advisor that if you want to, to go to war, we're ready. We are very strong and very powerful and we are able to fight the fight. And she responds with something that sort of becomes a classic in the Islamic tradition. قالت إن الملوك إذا دخلوا قرية أفسدوها وجعلوا أعزة أهلها أزلة وكذلك يفعلون. This is um, 34. Um, so she said, kings, kings here means powerful people. When they enter a town, when they enter a town means when they invade, they corrupt it. And they make it's honorable people debased, where they debase the honorable people. وَكَذَلِكَ يَفْعَلُونَ And they will do likewise, meaning that it's, it, it's a, an emphasis. She's affirming. So, her military says we're ready for war, but she is worried about the corrupting impact of war. And that war will do a lot of damage. It's not that she's saying we're going to lose the war, but she's saying the impact of war is going to be demoralizing. And she does what in the customs of the age was the typical thing to do. When you don't opt for war, you send a gift. You send a friendly response and a gift. And the gift will often tell you whether that foe is uh, very powerful, not that powerful. In other words, if the, if the opponent says, no, I want more, then, then it's clear their, their intention is to exploit and that they're sort of confident about their own power. But if they accept the gift, then you might actually opt for war because that means that they are leeches. They, they just want a payment. And you might have to go to war to make a point that no one can extort us. So her response about sending a gift is very reasonable within the the practices of her age. And when she sends the gift, what does Solomon do? Solomon does something that gets her attention. He says it's not about material wealth. It's not about gifts. And says, I am not accepting your gift. If you think you can buy me off, this is not what this is about. Again, just so for your own edification, in one of the um, well-known Sufi-esque text, it, it's a book called Al-Hikam al Ata'iyya. I, I don't know if it's translated to English, but um, it's a really... Hikam al Ata'iyya is to be read and reread and reread and relished. Um, Al-Hikam al Ata'iyya says something that is, is worth uh, about th this narrative. Uh, and especially the narrative in verse 34 about if kings invade a town, they, they, they destroy it and so on. So in the al Ata'iyya, he's talking about the wisdom of the Queen of Sheba and that uh, she was a a very reasoned and very rational and very balanced woman. And then he goes on to say, وَمَتَى الْوَارِدَاتِ الْإِلَهِيَّ عَلَيْكَ هَدَمَتِ الْعَوَائِدْ لَدَيْكَ 
إن الملوك إذا دخلوا قرية أفسدوها وجعلوا أعزة أهلها أذلة وكذلك يفعلون فكل وارد نزل بالإنسان لم يغير عليه عوائده فهو كاذب لا تزكين واردا لم تعلم ثمرته فليس المراد من السحابة الإمطار وإنما المراد منها وجود الأثمار He says that the Quranic narrative here wants to teach you a point. That any time you receive a divine lesson, A divine lesson has to change your habits. If you receive a divine lesson and your habits remain unchanged, then the lesson was a lie. A divine lesson has to produce change. If it doesn't produce change, then you haven't received the lesson. You might have heard the lesson, but you ignored it. Don't kid yourself that you're learning anything. However, he says, this Quranic comment communicated to us on the behalf of the Queen of Sheba about kings entering towns and so on. It's telling you a point that whenever you receive a lesson, whenever you listen to a lesson, think of the ultimate results that would come from that lesson. لا تذكين واردا لم تعلم ثمرته. There is no such thing as just a lesson without thinking of the ultimate results. Because remember that the point of clouds is not the rain, but rather the point are the fruit that grows from the rain. فَلَيْسَ الْمُرَادْ مِنَ الصَّحَابَ الْإِمْطَارُ وَإِنَّمَا الْمُرَادْ مِنْهَا وُجُودُ الْأَثْمَارِ So, and in Al-Hikam Al-Ata'iyah, he's saying that the Quran is actually communicating to us a, a from that, is that Think ahead. It's like, okay, it's not just what do I do about it, but what is the ultimate result? And when you think of a cloud, don't think about the rain. Think about what the fruit that will grow from the rain. Similarly, in any engagement with knowledge, think of the ultimate good that would come. If you, if there is no good to be expected, then you're going down the wrong path. In, in, in what he goes on to say that knowledge could become an addiction, and sometimes could become even a demonic addiction. When you become addicted to learning regardless of the morality of what you're learning. Okay. So again, this is among the, if you will, like the, the, the wonderful things that Surat al-Naml inspired in the tradition that I'm duty-bound to share with you. Um, Okay, but 
note the the personality of Queen of Sheba here as this is revealed, Surah al is revealed after Surah Maryam. And the personality of Queen of Sheba, as we'll see, becomes one of the personalities that actually um, inspires the role of women in, in early Islam. Uh, she's mentioned frequently by the women who were active at the time of the Prophet and Abu Bakr and Omar and you know all the way in in the at least in the first uh, uh, in the early Umayyad dynasty okay so let's go back again so now after Sulaiman rejects the the present Queen of Sheba then says okay well th this is this is not the typical situation um, I have to meet this man. And Suleiman knows that now there is going to be a meeting. And, you know, of course, travel takes a very long time at that time, so it's not like overnight. There's going to be months that pass before a meeting takes place. And Suleiman says, Let's prove to the Queen of Sheba that I, as a prophet, because he's not a king, he's a prophet, contrary to the biblical tradition, which often fudges that role and makes him look like he's just a king, not a prophet. Um, let's put it simply, impress the heck out of her. And we're going to impress the heck out of her because she, Queen of Sheba is reported to, the throne of Sheba is reported to have been a very fancy throne. Well, let's transport that throne from wherever it is to my palace. That is very impressive. You know, if, if can you imagine if I visited someone and they've transported my library to their building? You know, I'm going to be very impressed. You know, I'll fall over. Um, maybe my library is larger than the throne, but um, it's still pretty impressive. It is, right? <laughs> so... Um, So, so before she, we, we get to the throne, so first, قَالَ عِفْرِيتٌ مِنَ الْجِنْ أَنَا آتِيكَ بِهِ قَبْلَ أَنْ تَقُومَ مِنْ مَقَامَكْ وَإِنِّي عَلَيْهِ لَقَوِيٌ أَمِينٌ So a jinn tells him, I can bring the throne to you, and I can do it before you even leave your seat. قَالَ الَّذِي عِنْدَهُ عِلْمٌ مِنَ الْكِتَابِ أَنَا آتِيكَ بِهِ قَبْلَ أَنْ يَرْتَدَّ إِلَيْكَ طَرْفُكْ the person who has knowledge, this is 40, right? The person who has knowledge says, I will bring it, I will bring the throne to you before a blink of an eye. This gives pause to Muslim scholars. I can't it, it, it represent you how much is written on this small point. The jinn offers to do something remarkable. The person who has knowledge from the book will even top what the jinn can do. Now, there is a lot of speculation about who this person is who has knowledge of the book. Was he a minister? Was he al-Khidr? Was he... There are a lot of speculation. None of them 
very reliable. The best opinion I've read is that it doesn't matter because it's a symbolic point. And the symbolic point is, do you see the miracles of the jinn? And remember, I'm, I'm building up to what Surah al Namj has to tell us. Do you see the symbolic, do you see the miracle of the jinn? Well, knowledge, ilm, can even top that. So we've had now several flags. This is after Surah Al-Alaq started with knowledge. Surah Iqra start, affirmed the, the lesson of knowledge. Then we have Surah Al-Nam and Surah Al-Shara uh, warned us about false knowledge, fake news. And then Surah Al-Nam comes and talks about the type of knowledge that would allow you to hear the whining of ants and the type of knowledge that would allow you to have knowledge of faraway kingdoms and the type of knowledge that would allow you to even do go beyond that what jinn is able to do Okay, so she comes and he says, is this your throne? And her response to, to that, كَأَنَّهُ She's not going to confirm that this is her throne because she's not sure. Maybe he built one just like it. She says, it looks like it. كَأَنَّهُ Literally, it looks like it. But she's still not there. She's still not there because she has a lot of special interests in the power structure that exists in her kingdom. So comes the, uh, the knockout. What is the knockout? Knockout. Um, okay, forty-four. So she's invited to a pavilion. This pavilion is a technological miracle. The glass is built of glass and the glass is so well built that it looks like water. To the point that when she steps on it, she raises her dress because she thinks she's going to step into water, but then realizes that this is not water. And at that point, she says, okay, well, the, these people are far beyond anything I've ac we've accomplished, and she converts. So, we start out with Moses. Moses goes as an individual, as a liberator. He is aided by nine signs and some really miraculous things, but ultimately it doesn't end well, at least for the Egyptians, for the Pharaoh and his armies. 
In other words, the Egyptians remained defiant. Between Moses and Solomon are many generations. Between Moses and Solomon are a couple of centuries. Moses are the Israelites as it dominated our oppressed people in Egypt, lost in the desert for 40 years. The Israelites under Solomon are not just on top of the world, but they possess technological miracles. They, they, they can dazzle the eye. The, and this is, this is my take on it. How much time it took for the Israelites to go from Moses to Solomon? And is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala telling us, look, Solomon gets very different results because Moses comes with the truth. But Solomon comes with the truth and power. That the nature of people, remember, they, they, they're, they're hit with the nine signs and they still, they believe individually but still deny. But the nature of people is that the truth when it's aided with real power, technology, information, organization, enlightenment, it has a very different impact. But to get from Moses to Solomon, it took generations. And it took a lot of hard work. The type of work that reminds you of who? The ants. How many ants, human ants, existed from Moses to Solomon till we got from the Israelites of Moses to the Israelites of Solomon? Human beings that we never know about. It's not just Solomon by himself. It's Solomon was who built upon what David did, and David built upon the earlier Israelite generations. So Surat al-Nam then, so far, is telling the Prophet something, and Muslims, you know, something extremely profound. Sometimes, to have the kingdom of God, it will take generations. And it will take ants, generations of ants, human ants. But in order for this to happen, the ants must matter. If you crush the ants, if you are the type that stomps over the ants, you're out of the game. The ants matter. Then Surat al-Nam takes us to Qawm Saleh, 
We've encountered Qawm Salih before. These are the people of the camel, right? But this time, it's going to tell us something that it didn't tell us before about the people of the camel. So, just sort of make sure I don't forget, I'm not forgetting anything. By the way, um, because misogyny is always good and alive, uh, you find some weird male fantasies about this thing about her lifting her dress to show her legs. You know, just so you know. Um, it doesn't mean that it's an old tefasi or anything like that, but you know, that some that, mo that Solomon wanted to that he did this whole thing to see her legs and and that she had hairy legs and that Solomon didn't like hairy legs and, and, I mean <laughs> so yeah um, misogyny is, is, is always there and it, it always has its impact um, okay so now Contrast this rather classy interaction of the Queen of Sheba and Solomon to the dynamics with an Nabi Salih alayhi salam. This is um, uh, forty, like around forty-seven. So. Thamud, the people of Saleh, فَإِذَا هُمْ فَرِيْخَانِ يَخْتَصِمُونَ That they, he had a small group of people that supported him and a group of people that was very opposed to him. But their opposition is nearly infant, infantile in a sense, because they say that you're a bad omen. They're very superstitious. That's one. Two, they say, well, Why don't you go ahead and punish us? You you keep talking about God and God's punishments. Um, well, go ahead and make it happen. But the part that we are told about Qawm, Thamud, and Salih this time is Tis'atu Rahd Fil Medina. There are we're told that there are nine individuals in Thamud that cause corruption on earth. And in all the commentaries, they talk about how the, these nine, because this is because of the hadith of the Prophet, what he said about it is that he, the Prophet explains that these nine were the powerful noblemen of Thamud. And that the powerful noblemen of Thamud led the opposition group to Salih. And that this elite in Thamud aborted any attempt at At any real effort that Saleh supporters would make any headway. Eventually, the nine conspire to kill the camel. We know that. And Saleh then gives up on them 
and Allah destroys the people of Thamud, and Saleh takes his followers and migrates to a city in Yemen called Hadramut. When he arrives in Hadramut, shortly after he arrives in Hadramut, he passes away. And in fact, the city in Yemen is called Hadramut because when Saleh arrived, Hadar met. He died. Okay. But it is after the death of Saleh that the generations, that those who migrated from Thamud built the city of Hadramut, which still exists till today. So once again, we're invited to reflect upon the corrupting influence of the powerful. We're invited to reflect upon how consequences, even when there is immediate punishment, the real consequences take generations to come to fruition and the story moves on. So when you look at 52, their homes are abandoned. The homes of who? Of Thamud, the people who were destroyed. Their homes are abandoned and deserted. The remnants of Thamud whose homes are not abandoned and deserted are where? They're in Hadramut in Yemen. The contrast is amazing. Saleh himself didn't see the impact of the, 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 the generations that came from the people that left Yemen, left Thamud to go to Hadramut in Yemen. Hadramut in Yemen, I, I don't know after the civil war now how it is and after the, the, the Emiratis and Saudis bombed the hell out of Yemen, but Hadramut is one of the most unbelievable cities you could ever see in your life. It, it, it just, it just mind-boggling. Okay. Then it moves on to Qamlut. And Qamlut wa Lutan is called the Qamlut that you will be able to see the women and you will be able to see the women and you will be able to see the women without the women but you are a women and you are a woman so what was the answer of Qamlut but to say that you are the women and 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 you are the women um, this is 50 um, um, so and we sent Lot when he said to his people do you commit indecency though, though you see you really come with desire unto men instead of women, nay, but you are an ignorant people. Yet the reply of his people is not but to say, expel the family of Lot from your town. Truly there are people who keep themselves pure. 
So we saved him and his family except for his wife. We decreed that she should be among those who lag behind. So it was Qawm Lut among the, the things that you read in the tradition that their insistence on public acts of indecency, in other words, they in, uh, practice sodomy in public, other than what we talked about, their, their, their bizarre um, practice of r raping foreigners, which is very odd. Um, but here, it is as if sodomy for these folks was an ideology. Because it is not the issue of what they desire, but what they practice. We know, for instance, that in some periods in Roman history, there would be a systematic practice of sodomizing both men and women. Like, like as if sodomy is a is a is a is a, a way of exercising power, because sodomy could be a way of exercising power. But these are people who have turned the sodomizing of men into an ideology an actual systematic widespread practice that they did in public. But other than that, they also, it's not just about sodomy because they also refuse to believe either Ibrahim or Lut about their ultimate message, believing in one God and Allah's message. So, and with them, we're just simply told that they are destroyed with no aqibah. In other words, there is no generations like Hadramut, and there is no protracted engagement as with the Queen of Sheba, and there is not even the nuance of that we find in the in the in the drama that we have with the Prophet Musa salam. So these are the five narratives we've told about in Surah al -Nam. Just keep them in mind. Allah then takes the narrative back to the Prophet salam and says, this is in 70, And grieve not for them, and be not distressed by what they plight, what they plot. ولا تحزن عليهم ولا تكن في ضيق مما يمكرون ويقولون متى هذا الوعد إن كنتم صادقين قل عسى أن يكون ردفا عسى أن يكون ردف لكم بعض الذي تستعجلون وإن ربك لذو فضل على الناس ولكن أكثرهم لا يشكرون. So and they challenge the Prophet ﷺ by saying, well, when when is the things that you keep talking about going to happen? And what if I look on the list of stars alone is seventy-two. Say, it may be that some of what you talk about, what you're talking about, will be hastened, so it's so close to you. A lot of commentators say that it's it's as if you're, they're telling the prophet, well, when are we actually going to be punished? And 
Allah tells the Prophet to tell them, well, it might be sooner than you, some of it might be sooner than you realize. Predicting what? Predicting what's going to happen after the Hijrah. The, 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 the battles that Mecca is going to fight, the battles that Mecca... So, I mean, it, it's remarkable that in Surah Al-Nam, long before the Hijrah, it's telling them, well, you're going to taste a little bit of the hardship that you keep rushing, uh, like the people of uh, Saleh, who are saying, you know, where is it, where is it? Well, you know, it's some of it. And it's interesting that, you know, it's, it's fascinating that it says, oh, it's not going to be sooner than you, than you realize. It just says some of it. Meaning you're going to, to get some of the punishment which is, as we know in retrospect, in fact, what actually happens. Okay. And then, إن هذا القرآن لا يخص على بني إسرائيل أكثر الذي هم فيه يختلفون وإنه لهدى ورحمة ورحمة للمؤمنين. The remarkable thing is that in Mecca. Jews are not a major player in Mecca. And they are not the main interlocutors or the main enemies that Muslims have to contend with. But yet in Surah al nam it again foreshadows what's going to be of great relevance in Medina by saying this Quran actually resolves a lot of what the Israelites keep disagreeing about. You know, I, I wonder, Muslims who were receiving it at the time, what, what could it have possibly meant to them? Because they don't actually know what, what the relevance of any of this about resolving disputes among the Israelites till years later, after they migrate. And again, the Prophet is the the message is emphasized in Nakala Tusmu al Mauta Wala Tusmi al Summa Dua Iza Walla Mudbudin Oma Anta Bihadi al Umj Andala Latihim in Tusmu Illa Illa Mayumin Bihaya Tina for whom Muslimun that this is now eighty eighty one. You you're not going to make them hear if they don't want to hear. You're not going to be able to guide them if they don't want to be guided. Time and again, look how many times the Quran and it will continue. What's remarkable is even as late as Surah Al-Baqarah, Surah Al-Nisa, and Surah Al-Umran, and Surah Al-Ma'idah, that same message will be emphasized time and time and time again. You are not going to be able to guide the people you want to guide. It is not about who you want to guide. You are not going to be able to make people whose hearts are closed listen to any of it. What this verse 82 is among the most um, debated and mysterious verses in the Quran. وإذا وقع قول عليهم أخرجنا لهم دبة من الأرض تكلمهم أن الناس كانوا بآياتنا لا يقنون. Because here, in case you are not sure how it felt for the Quran to be foreshadowing things that are going to happen in Medina, well, here the Quran is foreshadowing things that haven't even happened in our time, I get arguably. Uh, and when it comes upon them, arguably the hereafter, we shall bring forth for them a beast from the earth who will speak to them of how mankind, of how humans were not certain of our signs. What is this Dabba that is going to speak to human beings? Most commenta commentaries tell you that this is among the signs of the hereafter, that this is among the things that would happen 
at the like right before the end of times. Um, but what is it? All the traditions that we have that talk about a worm that or some very strange looking beast, I mean, are not reliable. We, there are tons of traditions that describe some really fantastical stuff. But here is the thing. Idabba doesn't even necessarily mean a beast. Idabba is anything that treads. That's a dab. So what is that thing that treads that eventually will be speaking to human beings? I would lie to you if I said I have any clue. But, you know, I can't help but wonder whether the Quran is foretelling about some human invention that is going to be artificially speaking to human beings. Um, I don't know. Artificial intelligence? Aliens from outer space? UFOs? No. That's another topic, but Allah talks about that God keeps creating things in the in the heavens and earth that we don't know about. No? Why not? Okay. Now, no, uh, before we just leave the issue of the Dabba, in 82, وَإِذَا وَقَعَ قَوْلُ عَلَيْهِمْ أَخْرَجْنَا لَهُمْ دَابَّةً مِنَ الْأَرْضِ تُكَلِّمْهُمْ So, and when the word comes upon them, وَإِذَا وَقَعَ قَوْلُ عَلَيْهِمْ Although most commentators say it is talking about the hereafter, that, that it's a sign of the hereafter, like one of the final things that happen before the hereafter. But the Quran doesn't necessarily say that. It says, when the word comes upon them. وَإِذَا وَقَعَ قَوْلُ عَلَيْهِ So, it is fascinating. I mean, it is because the, there will be something that will speak to us or speak to human beings. Um, It is not that it's going to tell them about things that they were not sure about, but rather that Allah is commenting on this by saying that like woefully human beings don't believe in our signs. So that dab that will be talking to human beings, whatever it is, is going to be an event. But waqa'a qawlu alayhim usually in Quranic usage is ominous. So it is like saying when they are doomed, there will be a dab that will be speaking to them. I'm not, I don't usually deal with all the fitan and the shurut al and you know, all the things about what will happen before the end of times and so on. I don't like to talk about that topic because I, I think it makes Muslims uh, give up on life and stop trying. But this verse has always fascinated me. And 
after 30 years of reading, I've never read anyone that has satisfa satisfactorily addressed verse 82 in Surah al -Nam. Although I, I have a feeling that it has to do, it has to do with artificial intelligence. Allahu Akbar. Because after that, then it starts talking about the the day when the trumpet is blown, and so after that, it starts talking about the hereafter. So when when interpreters say that it's talking about the coming of the hereafter, it's not necessarily the text doesn't necessarily tell us. Okay. Um, Okay. Note another one of these um, points that has raised a lot of discussions in Surah Nam is verse 86 and 87. Oh, sorry, it's 87 and 88. And on the day the trumpet will be blown and whosoever in the heavens and earth will be terrified, save whom God wills, all will come to God in abject humility. And thou seest the mountains that though those supposed are solid pass away like clouds, the work of God who perfects all things. وترى الجبال تحسبها جامدة وهي تمر مر السحاب صنع الله الذي أتقن كل شيء إنه خبير بما تفعلون. The 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 debate that uh, most commentators say that it is after the trumpet blows the mountains will appear solid but in fact are moving. Some have said that's because of massive earthquakes that will be moving these mountains. But some have said that no, it, when you look, Sun Allah alladhi atqana kulla shay'in inna huwa khabirun bima tafaloon. When Allah talks about Sun Allah, the, the miracle of Allah's creation, that that that's usually not when Allah is talking about creation in the in a state of destruction after in the hereafter, but rather God is blowing. God is talking about the trumpets blowing. The hereafter comes. Period. Then beginning of sentence. God is talking about the mountains and say, you look at the mountains, these seem solid and stable to you, but in fact the mountains are constantly moving. Um, that the mountains appear constant, but in fact they move. Um, again, for the people of the the like to talk about scientific miracles in the Quran, that's an important point because the mountains do move all the time. Uh, I have a feeling I forgot something. I have that just nagging feeling. I did forget something. <laughs> I did forget. And it is really embarrassing. If you can figure out the stupid computer. Okay. So, go back to uh, go back So go to verse 
62. This is right after the story of Lut. قل الحمد لله وسلام على عباده الذي اصطفى الله خير أما يشركون أمن خلق السماوات والأرض وأنزل لكم من السماء ماء فأنبتنا به حدائق ذات بهجة ما كان لكم أن تنبتوا شجرها, شجرها أإله مع الله بل هم قوم يعدلون أمن جعل الأرض قرارا وجعل خلالها أنهارا وجعل لها رواسي وجعل بين البحرين حاجزا أإله مع الله بل أكثرهم لا يعلمون أمن يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء ويجعلكم خلفاء الأرض أإله مع الله قليلا ما تذكرون This is six, so I've read 60, 61, 62. And who created the heavens and earth and sent down water for you from the sky through, from, through which we make gardens grow, beautiful gardens grow. Is there a God alongside God, Ilahun Ma'Allah? Nay, but they are people who ascribe equals, associate partners to God. Who made the earth a dwelling place and made run, rivers run through it? And made farm mount and made firm mountains for it and made a barrier between two seas. Ilahun ma Allah. Is there a God alongside God? No, they associate partners with God. He who answers the one in distress when he calls upon God and removes the evil, and who makes you vicegerents of the earth. Ilahun ma Allah. Now, no, you have. Right after the Quran finished telling us about Surah Lut, I mean Qissat Lut. So right after it finished the five narratives, it draws attention to uh, our attention to the growth of gardens, beautiful gardens. Ijabat al muttar when someone is in dire necessity calling upon God, and then who makes you khulafa fil ard, who makes you vicegerents in the earth. You pray long enough about this. And then it starts, you start thinking of how long does it take for beautiful gardens to grow? How many micro movements take place to go from rain, seeds to gardens? How long does it take from when our relationship with Allah is based on necessity and response? This is the most primitive form of relationship. I call upon God when I'm in deep trouble. But to actually mature into a relationship where we are actually vice gods, khulafa for our gods, vice gerents on earth. And then for me, 
it made all of the Qasas of Surat al Namd click. Just that thick. From Moses to Sulaiman to and Nabi Saleh and the story of Hadramut to the travesty of Qom Lut, which doesn't end there because it continues when Lut unites with Ibrahim. What is the symbolic role of a number? Without exactly human beings performing the role that Enemli plays, micro steps by people who think they don't matter, but who actually the entire istikhlaf, the entire vice gerency, is founded on their shoulders. Put differently. In order for Suleiman to be Suleiman, he had to honor the ants. If Suleiman didn't honor the ants, Allah wouldn't have given Suleiman the type of powers that Suleiman was trusted with. But without the hoodhood, just a bird, the in, the, this entire drama of the Queen of Sheba and the it wouldn't have taken place. To get from Musa to Suleiman it takes generations. Understand that civilization and progress will take generations, but it will take human beings to understand the honor of serving the role just like ants do. If human beings do very unant like behavior, like Qam Lut, we're about aggression, we're about dominance, we're about, or as the Hikam al Ata'iyya talks about that they are about immediate satisfaction and immediate pleasure, like the way we're using up the earth right now. There will be no generations. There will be no Mo from Moses to, Sol to Solomon. There will be no from Saleh to Hadramut. There will be no from Muhammad والسلام, to the Islamic civilization that existed in the world for, for 1400 years. So Surat al-Naml, the final thing, how was Surat al-Naml received? The most remarkable thing is that these early Muslims honed in on exactly the honor of no task is too small in the service of Allah. So they got exactly that lesson from Surah al -Nabil. For years I was accumulating, because I was frankly, just fascinated by these people who would be given jobs by the Prophet early on. Often functions like the people who would keep Medina clean, the people who would 
bake the bread in Medina, the people who would herd the cattle in Medina. We, we, we learned the names of the Sahaba that fought battles and raised the barrier and, and banner and so on. But what we don't read about are the names of numerous people in books like Hayat al-Sahaba who performed very small functions but were greatly honored by the Prophet And what struck me is that these constant references in the, the in the seerah, in the same way that Aisha would refer to the Queen of Sheba several times, these constant references to Sharaf Amal in Naml, the honor of what what the ant does for the backbone of the Islamic civilization. Again, it is ahead of its time, but plays a critical role, a critical building block in the civilization that will become the Islamic civilization. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen.